Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to the latest edition of Flat Out, what I like to call the Decisode, the 10th episode of the Flat Out series so far, and a little special one to enjoy as well, some novel sections to debut on this 10th episode. We'll get onto those in just a few moments' time. But first of all, I'd like to reflect on a nice winner that we had at the weekend on this podcast. And I say we, the royal we, in actual fact, it was really just Joey Labour with Perotto winning the challenge handicap at Sandown on Saturday and Jack Nichol providing the second in the form of Uzo. But uh, Joey, what a, what a treat it was to see Perotto get his head in front again. Uh, it absolutely was. It absolutely was, Tom. It was a nervy watch in the final furlong, as I said. When you just spotted Nichols coming out of the pack, I just thought, Jesus <laughs> Christ, here we go again. We've got a pretty sour record, me and you, going head-to-head with him so far this year. So, you know, I just thought Uzo there is going to come and do me. But um, luckily enough, we stuck on well enough to the line. Um, you know, we stuck stuck with him through Royal Ascot, uh, forgave him, and sometimes forgiveness pays off, and it did on this occasion. And hopefully yeah, it will again did. with my tips for this week. <laughs> if there's one man you don't want beating you in a finish as well, it's Mr. Jack Nichol. Um, Jack, a, a big run, wasn't it, from Uzo as well? Yeah, no complaints on my part from Uzo. I thought he had every chance to go and win, but Prado, yeah, just by far the best horse on the day. Nice, nice tip from Joey. And if we come up uh, head-to-head once again, I'll, I'll try and get my revenge. Absolutely, I'm sure you will. Uh, it's a big. It was a big weekend, of course. It's a big week as well on racing TV. The Newmarket July Festival is forthcoming. Three days of excellence. And we've also got plenty of good action as well from York this weekend too. So plenty to enjoy. But what is coming up on the latest edition of Flat Out? Well, Joey, we said we'd uh, bring and introduce a special guest to this week. And Joey indeed has caught up with Mr George Bowie, one of the trainers, of course, of the moment. Uh, Joey, what kind of form was he in ahead of the July meeting? He was in great form. He was in great form, Tom. I mean, he was at the July sale, you know, doing things that trainers have to constantly do, looking to the future, keeping things turning over. But no, yeah, he had a few very interesting thoughts on Via Sistina. Um, you know, getting that Group 1 victory is important for a stable that's on the up and up like his is. And um, no, yeah, he was very interesting, very engaging. 15 minutes or so. Yeah, looking forward to hearing that. It'll be in two parts. Uh, the first one coming up very shortly on the likes of Via Sistina and Soprano. So looking forward to, to hearing that. Um, we're also going to have Jack running us a, a couple of horses to back uh, anti-post ahead of the weekend. Joey with a, a little bit of a Bloodstock update, Bloodstock Bulletin. And uh, I'm going to produce what I'm going to call Bully's Curious Case. Uh, whatever takes my fancy during the week that might be worth discussion. Um, so we'll come on to that a little bit later. First up, though, before all that, lads, let's have a quick reflection on the big race of last weekend. That was, of course, the Coral Eclipse that in the end went the way of Paddington. And it was a bit of a battle royale between him and Emily Upjohn, who, of course, gave him weight and Paddington's first step up in trip over that mile and a quarter distance. A small field, of course, only four runners. We got the same for the feature race on Thursday at Newmarket. So another example of of small fields um, for these big group races, which is a shame. But despite that, Jack, only four runners, we were treated to a really good finish. And Paddington is clearly a colt with tremendous ability and also potential as well over over this kind of trip and maybe even further in time, obviously maybe dropping back to the Sussex Stakes for his next outing, even despite that rather ungainly head carriage. Very much so. It was a it was a proper race, as I mentioned last week. Uh, making my first trip to Sandown, and the the main event didn't fail to deliver. It was a proper race, uh, as you said. There were only four runners. West Wind Blows went on, and it was good to see him do that. I was disappointed he checked out probably earlier than I wanted, of course. But um, that set it up for a real slobber knocker between the two main rivals. And <laughs> I thought Emily Emily Upjohn had every chance to to go past Paddington and. Uh, he has this pretty ugly head carriage, but my God, he's such a game and genuine horse, isn't he? And I, I think he could have run another two furlongs and she just wouldn't have got past them. He's just got the iron will. Obviously, those comparisons have been made, but it, it, it seems that he will drop back down to, to, to the mile for the Sussex Stakes. And he must just have some constitution. Uh, I read today that Aiden had said he'd already uh, bounced out the race. He's flying to him and they've already ridden him. Um, which I suppose would be standard, I suppose, after a few days. But um, no, look, uh, it was a real, it was a real classic of a race. I thought um, there was a few negative comments on social media. I said, oh, I don't really see what was going on there. But 
I thought that the crowd was electric. You, you had it. Each horse had no excuses. And uh, if anything, I think we probably didn't see the best of padding and you probably got there too soon. And uh, you just, he just really thought, fought, fought her off and he was a very worthy winner in my eyes. Yeah, I totally agree. What was that word you just, you described the battle between them? A slobber docker. A slobber knocker. Is it, is it PC? Is it PC? I'm not sure. Is it, can we say that? Oh, well, I'm, I'm reaching back to my days as a 10-year-old watching WWF, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was yeah, some kind of Lee Jordy yeah, yeah. Um <laughs> Joey, we, we just commented there on the four runners. Let's just get your take on the race itself. And and what can we do about, about four runner group ones? Is there anything we can do about it? Um I well, just on the on the negative comments, I thought, you know, you saw the coming from some counts more often linked with jumps racing comments. And I thought, Jesus Christ, that's rich lads and glass houses and throwing stones with small fields. I thought we got a great race, you know, having a few extra runners in there that are just there to fill up the field wouldn't have improved the spectacle in my eyes. But the fact the moment we got a decent enough gallop, we got a really, really cracking race. And I don't think there's a hell of a lot between them, to be honest. I really don't. I mean, I, I think it was a very good ride from Ryan. I think she was always going to struggle to go by him uh from you know a few length a couple of lengths down it was always going to be an ask for a filly that clearly can stay mile and a half i think she you know i i, I thought she might you know have she does have the turn of foot but it, it clearly he has enough pace to be a really top class miler so um and probably improved on the day and so yeah under a great ride i thought it was a really good spectacle and i thoroughly enjoyed it in terms of the more kind of political stuff and racing with the smaller fields i think you know you get to this point in the summer and it can get a bit like this with horses going this way and that um and it certainly doesn't help when you've got our kind of just slightly below top rung horses going to hong kong going off to australia the likes of waipiro um a couple of david simcox horses that you know where he's got quite strong links with australia as not in cash and light inventory horses that could have run in this race um Clearly, it's thinning out just below the bo below the top level, which is something which should concern us. But um, I still don't think it took away from the spectacle on the day. No, totally agree. The spectacle was certainly something. It brings me quite nicely onto what I'm going to talk about a little bit later in terms of the the world racehorse rankings and where the British and Irish lie within those. Uh, but we'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, my thoughts on the race: um, thought it was a cracking renewal. What I loved was uh, William Buick and and. Um, Obviously, Ryan Moore going head to head, two of the best jockeys in the world, fighting it out. And what I also enjoyed was the fact there was no hard luck story. You, you rarely get, I, I find these days, if there is a clash that's hyped up that actually really comes to fruition. Um, we, we do, of course, get it every now and then with, you know, a surname and Altior and then the flat crystal ocean and Enable. Um, it does happen, but it doesn't happen that often. I think we definitely got that with Enable and Paddington. And um, given that she was giving a, a plenty of weight away to Paddington. Um, I thought it was a cracking performance from the mayor. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a really exciting colt is Paddington. Hopefully they're going to they're gonna drop him back to a mile at Goodwood again. And we can see what he's like over that really sharp mile because it's a very different I'm not, test. I'm not a massively against, I'm not massively um, fond of the cribbing of his head carriage either because it, it seems to me like a, something where it's very clear that he's putting his nuts on the line for you there. Like he really is battling all the way. And it seems to be something he was doing for coming under extreme pressure and finding and finding. And it's something you, you do notice if you go back and watch some Mark's Basilica. He, he did a similar thing with his head. He had quite a high head carriage. You see it on a lot of Kingmans as well. I know people don't like the way it's cocked out to the side, isn't it? But I, he's just putting his all in, I think. And it might be something as well to do with a, a stronger leg he has, essentially, where, where, he's, where he's pushing from under pressure and it's making him cock his body to one side because he's leading, essentially, and trying to lead with his stronger leg. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too, too negative about his head carriage. Sorry, sorry, I don't sorry, think sorry. I, I, no no I don't, I don't think I think you're right I don't, I don't think it stops his um his ability to to produce his best if that makes sense I don't think it's anything to do with an attitude problem I think it's just maybe a, a quirk that he does have so I think in that regard you know if, if it was stopping some of his ability then my goodness me we've got a very exciting horse in our hands well, yeah. I agree with you I don't think it probably is no it's cool. not, I mean I, I I did a similar thing coming up the stairs with some shopping just now you know like I've got a stronger side so I'm giving it that one with the right arm you know taking the heavier bag it's just it's something athletes do don't they yeah, we all have our quirks I think so that's yeah. the point and, that was the and point. Uh, I think on this podcast Joey you are most certainly the the uh, most uh, I'd say <laughs> most athletic let's put it like that okay <laughs> 
<laughs> Jesus. Um, that's, I was going that's not a high thing. bar being set, lads. I don't think. <laughs> no, it isn't. Um, okay, that was uh, that was the action at the weekend last week. We've also got a, a, a big few days coming up with the New Market July meeting. With that in mind, our special guest this week was George Bowie and Joey Labour. Caught up with him about his thoughts on the coming few days in part one. I'm delighted to welcome George Bowie to Flat Out in association with our sponsors, Opulence Thoroughbreds, ahead of Newmarket this weekend. It's a pleasure to have you on, George. Firstly, I always think basically the July festival is an ideal time to take stock of how the season's going. Um, how would you assess your season to this point? Thanks for thanks for having me. No, it's uh, good to be on, and um, yeah, it's been going good. We've uh, we've already had a Group One winner was kind of our our aim for the year, and. Um, you no, know, we've had plenty of winners, and and they seem to be seem to be going good at the moment. So, I think it's all about for me the the second half of the year is where it where it really matters. It's nice to have some horses who've gone on to to be stakes horses already, but it's really about the sort of two year olds who are maturing to the second half of the year. And and I think as you say, the July the July festival is is where it sort of really kicks off. And as as you brought brought up Via Sestina, obviously it's a perfect place to start. I mean, as a trainer, I mean must feel fantastic when you prepare a horse you progress them through the grades and they get to their group one day and you see them come through the field with such uh such ease as she did that day over in the current um could you describe what that felt like i mean it must have been very satisfying yeah it was great i um oh, look, i'm the lucky recipient to to have the horse that she is now having matured into you know she's a beast of a five-year-old now and and i think you know a huge Credit has to go to Joe Chewett, who who had her for since she was a yearling two year old, and um, she's progressing incredibly well. And and I think even from four to five, the physical change has been has been dramatic. Really, she looks the the, the finished article now. And um, no, look, the guys at home have done a super job with her, and, and she wasn't she wasn't easy to start with. And um, no, look, a, a huge amount of credit goes to them. I'm very lucky just to have my name next to her at the end of her career, and um, hopefully she can go on and progress. And ground's always been kind of important to her. The ground at the Curra that day was probably described as good ground. Would you said that would have been about as fast as she'd ever really want to want to go on? Yeah, I think so. I it was a it was a big call from Steve and Becky Hillen to run her because you know they've they've minded her incredibly well for since we bought her at Tattoos as a yearling and I didn't think she'd run. Um, but we got a few mils of rain the day before and um, I actually spoke to Ryan Moore who said it was, you know, good to good to yielding, I think was the description what they were saying out there. And and it just gave her a chance to give her a chance to run and, and she's been a sound horse in training of late and um yeah, it was it was good to be able to do it, but I think that the best filly is is on the ground that we saw in the daily. You know, she's she's got a wicked turn of foot on on very soft ground, and she's enormous and seems to just plow through it. So uh, busy autumn awaits for sure. And so she's in the Falmouth on Friday, down to a mile for the first time. Is she likely to run, or are you thinking maybe later on go for more of an autumn campaign with her? She'll be declared. Um, I'm really pleased with how she's sort of come out of the pretty poly. I, you know, for a filly who sat last and had to make up a lot of ground and, and a track that, as always, does favour horses on the speed. It was even more so at the weekend, and I think only the only the apprentice race um, produced a horse that came from well off the pace, and they probably went a little fast. So, look, we'll try and run her at Newmarket. I think I think the straight track is. A massive asset to her you know she's she's almost unbeaten at Newmarket on the early mile and, and I'd love to try her on them um, on the July course but as we say the ground is always it's frustrating because you just love to run her and she's never tried ground as fast as I walked it last night it was it was pretty quick up there so um, we had a few mils of rain but we'll need significantly more to see her turn up yeah and I think Michael Prosser is already watering today from what I saw this morning and so he'd be you tend to get nice enough ground there. He tends to be fairly liberal with the watering. So you, you would be hopeful with a few showers around that she might take her place. Yeah, absolutely. But um, as we know, there are lots of targets for her coming up and um, it would be, sure. a, be a shame to to go and do something silly on, on ground that we know is going to be changeable in, in the next few months. 
for sure. Uh, to move on to another horse in, in the form of Soprano, she ran really well, didn't she, at Ascot in the Albany after not breaking great, getting a bump fairly early, and she made a pretty aggressive mid, mid-race move to kind of come into contention. I thought that was really impressive. What sort of trip do you see her kind of reaching her best over? I think she's actually going to end up being a miler in time, but um, the programme doesn't really lend itself to a, to, a, to a traditional seven furlong fillies only contest at the moment. And um, yeah, look, I, I couldn't be happier with her. Charles Eddery, who rides her every day, has ridden her from the start and, and is higher on her than he ever has been. So I think she is progressing. Physically, she looks great. Um, having thought she was well drawn at Ascot, she ended up sort of a few lengths behind on the side that didn't have as much pace. And I think it's probably understated quite William Buick's move halfway through the race when there was a horse who was struggling in front of him and he's had to pull her out and had to sort of go and find a bit more company and I could have asked her to go forward and be a bit more prominent and she might have finished a bit closer but for me it's a you know it's a long game with her she's out of a sister to a Breeders' Cup Ma winner and and you know there are lots of targets for her I think we know where the program fits sort of at Newmarket in the back end of the year and could follow the route that Cache went sort of out to America at the end of the year so look it's um it's one step at a time, but I couldn't be happy with her going into to this week's race. And so I'll come back to Cashier in just a second. But so she is likely to turn up on Friday as well in the Duchess of Cambridge. Yeah, I would hope so. Um, I don't look as, as we, we've got Vera Sestina and Soprano, who probably want slightly different grounds. But um, I wouldn't be afraid to run Soprano unless it was sort of proper soft ground and, and it doesn't look likely. So. It might just fall in the middle for the pair of them. And I think Soprano wants fast ground. And um, as we say, it looks unlikely to be to be Via Sestina's optimum ground. Could Soprano go off to America like Cache did? Absolutely. Something I, I, I spoke about it the other day, and, and I think she wants fast ground. I think the, the sort of easier mile out there at the end of the year could suit her. And, and she's a more sort of mature model, though she's still quite sort of lean and, and athletic. I, I I think that she will be kept busy this year. She's she loves her racing. She's actually a lot more relaxed now than than she was at Newmarket on debut and, and she seems the more we do with her, the more she seems to settle down. So I don't think travelling will be an issue for her. It would be no surprise to see her travel before, um, just to give her that sort of advantage. And you know, Cashier had gone to France before she went to America and, and I think it stood her in pretty good stead. And lead on to Cache, are we likely to see her again? So there is the intention that she comes back. Yeah, I hope so. Um, she's a filly who you know, had one thing after another at the back end of last year, and, and she's been an amazing servant for us. And, and I don't want to do anything that she doesn't want to do. She did a few bits of work in the sort of late spring into early summer, and, and we were all delighted with her. And I thought that we'd see her by now. Um, but... She's taken a while. She's still carrying a bit of condition. Um, she's not quite up to galloping yet, but there's a long year and, and I kind of having a, if she is able to get there, which we all very much hope that, you know, that it's certainly on track that she could have a busy autumn. And I think dropping back in trip, she, she doesn't carry a penalty if she drops into a listed race and there'll be an abundance of races for her where she could start off. And, um, but it's one step at a time at the moment. And she's, you know, she's very likely to end up at, at Tassels in the mayor's sale at the end of the year or, or a sale similar to that. And uh, and I think at the end of the day, she's a classic winner, probably going to a public auction. And, and I just need to have there in, in, in as good a condition as I can um, to do the owners the best they can. She's She doesn't owe us anything. And, and if she gets there, great. Otherwise, we'll, um, we'll keep trying. If she had one target this year you'd like her to make, which one would it be? I think there's always been a bit of a desire to, to take it back to America, try and, you know, the fast the fast run mile out there. I, I still feel like there's a little bit of unfinished business having having yeah. gone so close out there. And, um, no, she, she loves fast ground. She's a very agile filly who loves to turn in track, as we saw at, at Del Mar. And, um, yeah, it'd be quite fun to go out there, I think. Great stuff there from George Bowie in conversation with Joey Labour in part one. How great would it be to see Cache in America at the end of the year? Uh, Jack, what did you what did you make of those comments from George? Because obviously at the moment he's got some army of stars, hasn't he? Of course, headed by Group One winner Via Sestina. Yeah, very much so, Tom. Um, it's really exciting. Hopefully the weather doesn't deny us the chance to see Via Sestina back up so quickly. Um, 
there's been plenty of water put down and um, there is rain forecast so it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they would, they would take the chance maybe on the quicker side of the good i think that might just be okay um soprano she's a horse i like for this week as well so it's it's good to see some positive comments there from george maybe how he says there about being a bit more aggressive um going on she is sure to stay further looking at her pedigree there there's the, the, i think there's a breeders cup mile or a, something like that that, that that would suggest that so I'm, I'm looking forward to her maybe a bit more aggressive that last furlong at, at the july course i think it's important to note that it's a, it's a really stiff um, finish, and it, it probably is a bit stronger than the Ascot course, which is stiff enough in its own right. So looking forward to her as well. And, yeah, a few little nuggets there. I'm looking forward to, to the second part coming up. And, um, yeah, I'm sure he's got some uh, little nuggets for us to follow. Yeah, certainly. And, and Joe, what I love about George Bowie is the fact he's not sh- he's not afraid to shy or crab a challenge, isn't he? He's always up for for running his horses in really strong races. And I think, you know, if he does run Via Sestina in the former, that's a really good example of that. Yeah, he's punchy, isn't he? I mean, like, you know, to draw on a kind of jumps comparison, he's got a bit of the Paul Nichols about him. He's not afraid. He's not absolutely not afraid to take on any challenges. He's at it. He's absolutely absorbed in what he does for a living. He's not doing any of this for a social day out here. There, You know, he's fully absorbed in his horses. He takes it all extremely seriously but still conducts himself like a right, like a real gentleman. He's really good to deal with. Uh, he's just a top, he's a top, top trainer and a top bloke. And I think it, there's no doubt that he's going to the top of this top of the sport. And you can see uh, how horses improve and how well he's placing them. And uh, yeah, what, what, what a um, superior operator he is. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Part two coming up very shortly. But first of all, let's go through our best bets for the weekend. Uh, just a quick word on what the ground is likely to be like at new markets. There is... Well, there are a few showers forecast, but not a huge amount. At the moment, good to firm. Michael Pross are going to be watering a touch. So we might well get good ground come come the, the, the few days. It'll be between good to firm and good ground, I would imagine. And uh, good to firm, good in places at Ascot uh, with some showers forecast and good ground at York with very little rain forecast at the moment. So hopefully we're going to get good between good and good to firm ground at all three big meetings uh, this weekend. And of course, the forecast generally is pretty dry and it's been pretty warm over the last couple of weeks or so, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, let's start with you, Jack, shall we? And what I really wanted to comment on, first of all, was not only is it a really good few days at Newmarket this week, but um, York and Ascot have both got plenty to enjoy as well. Yeah, very much so, Tom. Um, usually around this time of year, you get people moaning, oh, super sad, is too much racing on and all that. But it happens every year. Nothing ever changes. I'm just looking forward to that sort of rearing its head on Friday. It's boring enough. Um, if anything, they could maybe move one of the the, the courses to a, to a Sunday, but then they'll be moaning like As- Ascot wouldn't want to move. Chester, I suppose, could be the one that goes to the Sunday, but oh, but we want our sat- Saturday crowd. So what do you do? I don't know. But what I do know is I'm looking forward to the race, and it's always a great weekend. Um, the week after is a bit quiet, I suppose. You, you have Super Sprint and Irish Oaks weekend, so... Maybe it could be spread out in that respect. But, um, yeah, in terms of the main event this weekend, obviously it's at the, the July Festival at Newmarket, headed by the July Cup. And that is where my best bet of the week comes. Uh, I'm not sure it's a vintage renewal this year. I'm going on the proviso that the little big bear doesn't run. I mean, the fact he's missed six days of work, you can't do that, especially going into a group one. I can't see him running. I'm just not a fan of Shaquille as well. So, for whatever reason... I, 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 I just don't rate the three-year-olds either. Um, so with that in mind, I just think the class act in this race is Kinross. Um, we know from the start of the year, this is going to be the big fairy fairy tale story with Frank Vittori bowing out. The iron, irony is that obviously he can't, can't ride him now, but th- this, this has been the plan to the minute for this horse. As I, as I mentioned earlier there, that the, the stiff finish at Newmark, that's going to be perfect for him. He's an absolute seven furlong tool. He's shown he has no problem with over six furlongs as well. And that last furlong, he'll be absolutely powering up the hill, whereas some might not be seeing it out quite as strongly. And I'd say Beckett's going to have him primed to the minute for this. I think Buick's going to be on the ride, so he's a more than able deputy. And I just think he's a he's a filthy each way bet enough. And I really can't see him out the places. And yeah, very much so. He'd be my best bet over the next few days. You make a strong case there, Jack. One thing I would like to to uh, fire back at you in rebuttal slightly is your sure. 
your statement there about Shaquille is a very strong one. And for me, he was arguably the most impressive winner at Royal Ascot. So I was just yeah. wondering what, what your reason, if there is any reasoning apart from the fact that the three-year-olds may not be the strongest bunch. Well, that would that would be the main angle, Tom, to be honest. Um, obviously, now we get to see him taken on as elders. For whatever reason, I, I, I just don't think he has the class of, a, of the likes of a Kinross. It may, it may be soon enough in the year for him. Historically, we, we know Kinross co- co- comes alive in the second part of the season. I just think his whole season will revolve around this, maybe going on again to the to Ascot and maybe the foray and the like. But for me, I, I think Shaquille's short enough at, at, at a shade of under two to one. I'm not sure who's going to ride, providing that Little Big Bear doesn't run, that could open up Ryan Moore. So that's going to be a tremendous booking in its own right. As you have Blue going at the start of the season, she looked maybe a Group 3 listed performer. Of course, she won at York. That, that's a clear career best. What Was Highfield Princess at her best that day? I don't think so. I think she's maybe a bit short in the market in that respect. And I would just have Kinross maybe half the price. I would I would have him near enough favourites for this. Um, after that, you've got Cardem, who was a bull from the blue at Ascot. Lazoo probably doesn't run. Cool case isn't good enough. Um, meditate, has she been retired? Quite possibly, I'm not sure. Um, Run to Freedom could be an interesting one at a price, but then, you, as I say, I don't think it's a vintage renewal. We know Kinross is an absolute top-class performer, and, and for me, it's 6-1. to one. He is by far the best bet. Yeah, strong case made even stronger, I would say. <laughs> Sorry, Jack, Well, I mean, I would... I... I would, I would, I would take uh, issue again with like. I, I think the cold case one's brutal to say that he's not good enough. Like, I mean, I think the if you go and watch, you know, in, if you go back to his Haydock run behind Little Big Bear, he had no chance on that type that side of the track. That's just that's just a complete throwout run for me. And if you go back and look at the rest of his form, I don't think you can really chuck him out yet. And I think, I mean, I think you'll be better to defend him. Than maybe me, Tom. I, mean, I would support Jack slightly when I look back. I mean, I did say that I thought it was one of the more impressive problems of Royal Ascot. The more you do look back at it, though, you've got swing along in in third, you know, beating a couple of lengths. It's it's not. It's, and she's going to go. Exactly, she's yes, going to go to York on Friday in, in, a, in a Group Three, and she probably won't even be favourite, will she? So I just I have doubts on the the form and and of the three road. I do, yeah, I just don't think you can quite write off cold case. Yeah, I think he's an, sure, an improving that's, horse. That's and he, you know, he's beaten he's beaten some nice he has beaten some nice ones in his, oh, his, his, you know, his defence yep. this year. As a Brad Sell's gone on and won the King's Stand. So I mean my kids are pretty you know, I, I think as well. Of course, of course. But I mean I, I think I think that horse can yeah, I mean you're fair enough. Fair enough. I'll, I'll take that on cold case, but I mean you're getting a nice price belt him anyway. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, you yeah, know, sure. I'm I'm I'm, I'm Causing all this argument, and I completely agree with you. The thing <laughs> is, he, he, he's probably not even going to run. He needs he needs an ease in the ground, doesn't he? So yeah, and he got he, he does. He, I mean, he was so untreated, wasn't he, by Haydock's ground? I mean, you know, uh, Kirkland got all that stick for not watering last time, and he was one of the main kind of sufferers, wasn't he, for that? Yeah, he certainly was. I mean, I, and I, but I am I am also with Kinross here in a very strong way. I, I agree with Jack that I think he's by far the classiest in here. And he should be near enough favourite for this. Uh, he's he's just got so much form. I mean, it, the only problem is that he kind of rumbled into it last year, didn't he? And you know, he's been a bit. We haven't kind of flown out the gates like last year, and actually got a load of runs under his belt. So it might he might turn out that he, his best runs will be the one after this, and then he'll start building again. I think that's my only slight concern. But I, I think he is, as Jack says, a very strong each way bet in this. The other one would, for me would be Vad Dream if it actually if you did get some rain. Mm. But and we also should be pointing out that if you go back and watch recent renewals of the July Cup, it, they are strung out like washing sometimes. You know, like it's I the the way the ground is uh, on the July course, it can be very very funny. And um, so with him chucking twelve mils, what is it? Twelve mils? I think he's put on today. It could be. You know, there could be a little bit more juice in it than anyone, any of us would like at this time of year. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. But yeah, and that would be all to Kinross's favour as well. So yeah, I'd be very strong with Kinross as with Jack. Yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right. If it does come out on the softer side, Vadrim would be a, a big player, Joey. Uh, what would your best bet of the weekend be? Is it Kinross or something else? It wouldn't. It Well, it, I mean, it would be essentially, it would be... Kinross would be like the kind of the strongest fancy, but the, the kind of the best bet is is a, is a kind of a mix of things in it. And I, for me, that's definitely definitely going to be Biggles each way. 
um, in the Bunbury Cup. Um, there is a caveat, slight, slight early on. It's always with anti-post bunting. I will be back in this horse, but there is a chance he will miss miss it and go for the seven furlong race that precedes the King George Ascot. You know, his form there is fantastic. There's no doubt. But I think the last two runs he's had and the run before has shown he's in red hot form, really top form this year. Off a mark of 100 each time, he's run three absolute cracking races. And I think you can make big, big excuses for him uh, on the last two occasions as well. Um, in the Victoria Cup, he won all but, you know, obviously a, a handicap block has won this, but he's won his side. He's come through and won quite impressively. Um, I, what I would think I would really like to see is I'd like to see him be drawn near the pace. I, I think, you, you know, he can find that. Yeah, you know, it's always hugely important in these races that you've got pace around you rather than where you're drawn and sides of the track you want to be on. The most important thing is you've got some pace around you, especially like him, I think really needs to be towed into, towed into the race. Um, but yeah, I think with with that and winning is basically near enough being fair in the best of the low draws uh, at Royal Ascot last time. He's just a horse I think can do some real damage. And in these big heritage handicaps, you want to be with these classy animals, I think. And you'll have to go through the year. You keep backing them. In a similar vein to Perotto last time, you'll get some bad luck. You won't win with them, but you've got to keep with them when you think you can win off the mark. And they've, if they've got the class to do it, they will. And I think the course will also suit him very well. That's my case for Biggles. Lovely stuff. Cheers, Joe. Yeah, great case made, I have to say. Um, my best bet of the weekend, I'm going to go with a Regional at York, who probably is going to run in the John Smith City Wall Stakes, and that comes on Saturday at 2.35 over the Flying Five Furlongs. As we all know, all of us flat racing lovers, that regional is fast improving. It's been turned around this season, really, by Ed Bethel, whose strike rate so far this campaign is phenomenal. He's operating at 28% with all his runners, but if you look at his, his three-year-olds on turf, he's at 15 winners from 44 runners, which is 34% strike rate. I mean, he's absolutely flying wherever you look. He's his horses are running well. And of course, Rachel has won both his starts this season so far. I was particularly impressed with him last time out when beating Equilateral at Haydock. That was a really good performance, I thought, on the Achilles. Now, this time he's got to carry a penalty. He's giving Equilateral three pounds. But I think if he carried three pounds extra at Haydock last time, he probably still would have won. And let's be honest, he's a five-year-old. Equilateral is an eight-year-old. And he's improving at a rate of not. So I think he's going to confirm that form. Uh, if Equilateral goes there. The other couple I'd be a little bit fearful of would be Queen Me, uh, the three-year-old filly for Andrea Zaney and Kevin Ryan. She was just beaten three lengths by Shaquille Ascot last time, and she gets bags of weight here, but I think she'll need to improve, and she drops back in trip. I'm not sure he's going to have the raw pace to see off the likes of Regional. And the other one would be Great State. He's also one exposed as a three-year-old. Also gets a bit of weight. He's been improving, but I was disappointed when he got beaten last time at Sandown behind Lady Hamana, he was also in favour that day. And I do rather wonder if his improvement has just come to a, an abrupt and slightly curtailed end. And I think, you know, regional come the day is going to be shorter than he is now. He's around about five to two. I think he'll be very much seven to four, six to four shot come the day. Um, and I think he'd be really hard to beat. He looks to me like he's going to be a proper group sprinter by the end of the year. And uh, this being another listed race, I think he's he's got the class edge in here, and I'd be surprised if he didn't win, to be honest. He's also got that course form as well, having won a, a competitive handicap, the Lyndham York handicap at the Navesmire, or the Navesmire two starts to go. So he'd be my best bet of the weekend. And um, go on, Joe. I just wanted to add that I left off, that the ground can do what it likes with Biggles and Ryan Moore's jocked up. So I'd be hopeful we'd be getting a run at 12 to 1 each way. That would be just uh, my final little bits on that one. Nice to get Mr. Moore in the plate, isn't it? Always. <laughs> oh, um, always. Yeah. Don't you know it. Uh, Jack, let's come to you then for the rest of the bets on, on the weekend for you. Well, uh, Biggles is the place to stay. Um, I, I would just add further weight behind what Joey says. Um, it, it looks, uh, as Joey's just mentioned there, Ryan Moore is jocked up. And yeah, I think Beckett's got a really strong hand in this with Star of Orion as well. Um, just come and staying with Biggles there. He ran such a great race at Ascot that he was on the wrong side. And Ryan, if you see in the last furlong, 
has brought them towards the middle that they were going forward. He's finished first of, uh, I think, six or seven in his group, and it was a massive race. And um, the fact he wasn't changed off a, a mark of 100 from his penultimate start suggests that I think he's still got a few pounds up his sleeve. So, um, yeah, I'm very much with Joey on, in that respect in the Bunbury Cup. I'm interested to see what Star of Orion does as well for Beckett. As I say, I think he's got a strong hand. He went off nine to one in the race last year at Star of Orion. He was on the wrong side. There was only two runners. And it was just a shambles. He ran in that off 98 last year. He's off 92 this year. He's, he's We've seen a bit more of a semblance of form. He's been runner up in his two starts. He's he's around 16 to one. I haven't backed either horse yet. I probably probably will get on Biggles, but um, yeah, I probably will just wait to, as Joey said, I, I'm interested to see the pace and playing it like that. So um, I'd wait for, for Dex and, and seeing how that works out. The last thing I'd want is another star of Orion last year. Um, horse, I, I, I'm interested again. I'm going to, it's, it's hard because he's doubly entered as well as a horse called Amleto. He's a full brother to Sea of Class for William Haggis. He, he's um, he's in the John Smith's Cup and he's rated, he's in, in line of 24 and there's going to be 22 get in, so I'm not sure he's going to run yet. I don't even know who would ride the horse because he's going to be off like seven stones, 10 or something. But Haggis has won this three times in the last 12 years. I'll just keep an eye out, see where he goes. He could go for the um, 10 furlong race at Newmarket on the Friday. So wherever he goes, I was really impressed with, he, with him when he absolutely bolted up at Chester. So again, those we two maybe way for Dex. Um, we are going to come to George in a second, and I'm very interested to hear what he says about Conquistador, but as you know, I, I, I was really strong on him for Ascot. I thought maybe he was just a little bit cold, perhaps the, the left a, a little bit to, to work on. I think coming back onto the turf in a race like that and then the pomp of, of Roy Ascot might have just caught him out a bit. You watch him in the race there, he, he hits a bit of a flat spot in, in the middle. Coming back, he's got a few few options. I'll be interested to see if George does pinpoint anything. But um, yeah, I'm, uh, there's no marketers yet. But as you know, I'm a big fan of this horse, and I think he, he's definitely got more to come off his current mark as well. So those would be, but be the bets as well. Soprano is another interesting one. Um, as I, as I said earlier, I think she she might be one to wait for over a bit further as well. But um, yeah, Conquistador. Biggles in the, in the Bunbury Cup and see where Amleto goes as well. That would be the best of the rest. Lovely. Great cases made all round there, Jack. Looking forward to seeing all those hopefully running this weekend. And Joey, uh, you finish up your, your best bets as well? Yeah, I mean, obviously, so I, I basically have highlighted, you know, we, obviously me and Jack feel we've highlighted probably different points and, and kind of made a very full case for Biggles as the best bet. I really am strong Kinross, as I've said. Um, in terms of others, the superlative often isn't the strongest of group two. Well, the strongest of races, kind of group races for these the two-year-olds this time of year. You can usually do quite well with one that's kind of uh, just a consistent sort. And I, I quite like Hartem in this. I think he ran a fantastic race in the Coventry that kind of went under the radar. The form of that is fantastically strong. You know, the third having won the railway stakes the other day. Um, Hartem before that ran what I thought was an extremely eye-catching race at Epsom, where, you know, he's fallen out of the stalls and given away five lengths. He's then cruised back into it and stayed on well to the line, I think. Um, I think he's a horse that will do well up to seven. I'm not sure about a hell of a lot further based on his pedigree, kind of Felix of Spain. But the way he stuck, up, stuck on in that you know, at Royal Ascot in the Coventry, I thought it really suggested that that might bring out a bit more improvement. He has a lot of experience, and I think that might pay... For, might help him in this, especially against some some inexperienced ones coming in. I know I know you like one of them, Tom, after a debut, but I think I think Hartem is a pretty pretty solid solid proposition around the kind of four to one nine to two mark. So I, yeah, I'll be I'll be having a one point win bet on him as well, um, and I'll be be keeping an eye out for the Cadillac. Um, I we don't really know what's going on yet though, and so that's one I can't really comment on. But I I would be forgiving him. Nearly be getting basically rugby tackled by Frankie Tatori, um, and and just just as a just as a, um, a a kind of wouldn't it be kind of ironic, fantastic ironic that Ken Ross would go and win the July Cup, the one Group One he hasn't won yeah. <laughs> the year when he gets banned for 
committing a bit of like common assault like you did that day to my nap of Royal Ascot. So, you know, there be a, there might be a slight, especially as I fancy Kinross as well, there'll be a big old grin on my face if he goes over the line in front on, on Saturday afternoon. Um, but yeah, that, that, that rounds it up for me, Tom, this week, I think. On what is a very busy weekend, as Jack's highlighted. Yeah, a big old grin on your face and a big old grimace on Frankie Dottori's face uh, if Kinross goes in on Saturday. Um, I'm going to finish off mine uh, after regional, of course, being my best bet. I quite fancy Mighty River on Friday at Newmarket in the opening handicap. He's the only entry for him for the weekend, so hopefully he goes there. Uh, I was at Newmarket when he won last time out in handicap company. I spoke to James Tate, the trainer, afterwards. And he said he's a really big strapping horse who just takes a while to really come to hand and get fit. And he said that this is when we're going to start to really see him now. He's found his strength. He's filled into that big frame. And I was quite taken by his win last time because although it came in a couple of grades below, slightly weaker company, it was still a fairly contested race. And he missed the break as well before getting a prominent position, which usually on the July track would mean, you know, those exertions are going to pay off a little bit in the early stages at the, the latter end of the race. But it wasn't to be. He finished off the race really strongly, hit the line very well indeed. And I always like it when horses have proven themselves on the July track because it has got that uphill finish. And he seemed to relish it as well. He's got up four pounds for that. Neil Callan, who's in the plate that day, has already been booked, which is a good sign. And he's an improving three-year-old. Well, I think we've yet to see the best of. Around at the 14 to 1, 16 to 1 mark. I think he's a he's a he's a pretty good chance, an each way chance in that race on Friday. And I'm gonna give one more chance. I know everyone's gonna groan here, uh, to Royal Acclaim, James Tate Sprinter at Ascot on Friday. Um whether or not she goes for the race is slightly up for debate. Um, but I think she's certainly got a chance um if she is happy over the six furlong trip because obviously we've seen her over five furlongs so far and um she looked very exciting early on in her career and it's just been a little bit of a a stop starter so far for her and um i think maybe the step up to six furlongs now is what she needs if you watch that air race last time she traveled just got a little bit outpaced and i think stepping up to six is going to be exactly what she needs and so i give her another chance uh, at ascot and hopefully um that extra trip is going to play into her hands a little bit for uh, for her. And then the other one I wanted to talk about was Pura Sangue, who is not going to be a tip of mine necessarily, um, but a, a horse that I'm really looking forward to seeing. And um, he is in the opulent thoroughbred colours, of course. And I was at Haydock the day that he made his most impressive debut. He goes for the July stakes this week and is a fairly strong fancy for that as well by plenty. And you can see why, because he's named after... A Ferrari, and he certainly travelled and finished like one as well at Haydock. So uh, I'd be keeping a strong eye out for him in that race. He was really impressive. Uh, I was with Mark Howard, Racing TV pundit that day, and he was blown away by the opening performance of him. He said it was really impressive. Loved the way that he knew his job and loved the way that he quickened as well on that near side rail. The form hasn't worked out great, but I, I have to say he couldn't have won any easier. He really couldn't have done. And I just loved his attitude. So I'd be very keen on seeing him stepped up in grade. He wouldn't be a tip, as I say, and neither would City of Troy, who's the other one I wanted to chat about. He goes in the superlative up against Hartem, actually. Um, but he's already got entries for Aidan O'Brien in the big group ones towards the end of the season in Ireland, the Phoenix Stakes and the Goff Spinster O'Brien National Stakes. And the way that he won his debut took my breath away a bit because it was at the Curra. He knew his job early and I love the way he hit the line. He ran on so strongly inside the final furlong. And I thought that was a most taking debut. And uh, he looks like the one to follow, I think, for Aidan O'Brien in those group ones towards the end of the year. So looking forward to seeing how he gets on in that superlative stakes. But given that this is an Opulent Thoroughbreds podcast, or at least sponsored by Opulent Thoroughbreds, um, Pura Sangue is a horse I'm very much looking forward to and um, runs in those colours. And as we know, George Bowie trains a few of the opulent thoroughbreds colour. So let's have a, have a listen to what Joey uh, and George talked about in terms of maybe future targets ahead of these uh, opulent horses for the rest of the campaign. Part two. Opulence has three horses in training with you. One heading to the sales this week in the form of the match. Show. went quite close to winning at Kempton last week. Will we likely maybe to see Sun King or Paris Lights in the coming, coming in the future? Yeah, I think um, Paris Lights actually done very well. Uh, I probably stepped him up too far in trip and he went a mile and a half at york and you know it was a pretty searching gallop and he actually traveled well into the race i 
William Buick thought that he he did see the trip out, but I just thought that when he we dropped him back to ten, he just travelled better into the race and and back on the all weather. I think you know that's possibly where we'll see him. Um, there's limited options for a horse of his rating, his age, really at this time of the year. So there's a there's a ten furlong handicap at Sandown in sort of ten twelve days time where he could go. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to see him back at Lingfield or, or there's a race at Chelmsford a um, couple of weeks' time. So, no, he's, he's a fun horse. I, I think he needs a bit of ease in the ground and it was fast ground at York that day. So, um, look, he's doing well and, and the guys have been really patient with him. And he started off great. You know, he won his first start, then was second at Lingfield. And um, we'll try and keep him on left-handed tracks where possible. Great. And Sun King? Sun King um, has been a, a fraction disappointing. I I hoped that we might have seen him in the winner's enclosure by now. And um, he ran good on his first start over a mile at Kempton. And he just sort of threatened to get a bit further. And, and we brought him to try and get a bit further. And I think we were slightly lured into that by him hitting the line strong in the um, in the Golden Gates behind Mr. Cut last year. And I actually had a chat with George and Sam Haggis who brought him and, you know, we're going to try and drop him back to the mile. He's he's shown plenty of pace at home. And I think from the wide gate at Pontefract, he did plenty to get there. I think he's drawn double figure draw. And we all know that you've got to do plenty to get there at Ponty. And um, he was a little weak in the finish and bringing him back to the mile is probably where we'll go. Um, he's now in a 0 to 85, and, and I hope he should be pretty dangerous. Um, he's 10 or 12 days away, but nearly ready to go. Great. And as a more general point, George, how do you view the importance of syndicates in horse racing ownership in the coming years? I mean, what do you think they bring to the table? I think it gives more people a chance to experience what we all love. Um, you know, it's a. I've got a lot of horses owned by syndicates. I think you know between sort of. High Clear, Opulence, Midland Park, they they own quite a big percentage of my horses. And and I, I think, you know, we actually love having people to see their horses in the yards. And that's a big part of it. I think, you know, you've got to try and having winners on the track is the main thing, but but trying to get people to enjoy the whole experience is is a big part of it. So um I my first Royal Ascot winner was syndicate owned. Um I put together a partnership of people and they've become very close friends. Two of them knew each other before, but the rest of them didn't. And it's a, it's a great way to bring people together and with a similar interest. So having worked in Australia and seen how well it works out there, we'll continue to, I'm actually just at the July sale here at the moment, trying to buy horses that we'll probably end up syndicating. So um, yeah, it's it's got to be the way that racing's going at the moment and um, long may it continue. I think people underestimate how much exposure you actually get, you know, how everyone's welcomed into the yards and how much they can actually get out of it rather than just, you know, sitting there and having a small portion of a horse at home and watching them on the telly. Yeah, I think so. Look, opulence of their visits around Newmarket and Lambourne and Andrew Paulding's, they're, you know, they're widely documented on social media. And I think it's it's yeah. great to show people what they can actually do and, and huge numbers of people coming to see their horses. So, um, yeah, look, it's, it's certainly the way to go, I think, at the moment. Fantastic. I'll just gallop through a couple more horses for the weekend. You've got Baradar and Span Spangled Mac. I'll start with Spangled Mac. I mean, I guess the question with him is what his, is his best trip? He's in in three different places over the coming weeks, and he kind of got on a bit of a roll in previous years with lots of runs backed up. Um, is that is he likely to do that again, ending with the Stewards' Cup, maybe? Uh, he's, look, he's a horse who probably is versatile. He wants a stiff six or a seven. Um, I think he wants fast ground. He was a fraction unlucky in, in Dubai on his last start. And, and we actually thought he'd run the, as big a race as he did at Ascot um, in the Buckingham Palace. But look, he's a horse who he's going to pop up one day. I don't know when it's going to be. Um, if it's via Sestina's ground this week, he won't run and, and we'll run Baradar. But he, I think his race is the, um, the international. I think it was called the Gigaset at, at Ascot on King George Day. Um, I just like that track for him. He ran his probably his career best almost at, at, at Asco over six um, and was just searching for a bit more ground. So that, that the seven at Asco is kind of ideal to him, but his ability to back up quickly is is great for the owner and great for everyone at home because he doesn't do much. And 
and he'll probably run this weekend and, and then go to, to Ascot for King George Day. So, um, look, he's a fun horse and he's a winner of five, six races last year and doesn't really owe us anything, but, but sound horse and keeps turning up. And Baradar's in the same sort of situation as Via Sestina regarding this weekend. Yeah, yeah, I think so. We, I think if you look through Baradar's form figures, I think he won his maiden uh, a long time ago on fast ground and, and was probably just a better horse than them. The, the horses in behind have, I think, got fours and fives in front of their ratings now. So it was no surprise that he won his maiden, but he does really need soft ground. And um, Keir and everyone at Ammo were pretty happy just to roll the dice. He's he came out of the race good and but we didn't think he'd like the ground and but we didn't know you know he hadn't run on it for two or three years and um we can now put a line through that and, and pretty safely say that he won't be turning up unless it's unless it's slow ground he's you know there are lots of races for him at the back end and i think seven's probably his specialist trip he didn't quite get home in the um in the lincoln he i think he almost traded odds on him running he's full yeah. of running but it but it was a long way home from over the mile so Seven furlongs. Um, yeah, he's also in Ascot and could go there as well. Yeah, he's certainly one that's been tipped on this podcast a few times this year and broken a broken heart once. Um, there's one horse that Jack Nickel actually on our podcast. He used to work with Sam Haggis actually um, when he worked at Haggis's many years ago. He wanted me to ask about King Lear. Uh, he says the dogs have been barking about this particular horse. Is that is that some you can you fill us in on King Lear at all or King of Lear? King Lear, yeah, he, King Lear. The, probably the dog must have been barking quite recently because he's, he's been um he's been fast asleep for about the last six months. Really? But he he did work nicely this morning um with a maiden winner, but he's look, he's from a late maturing family and and he's proving just that. Um, he was a very immature horse. We kind of bought him as uh, like a yearling in the literally a week a month ago a month ago a year ago today, um yeah. and he's finally getting there he's he's been lucky that he's owned by one of the more patient men in Ed Babington and and understands the horse and understands the pedigree and but he did work nicely this morning Pat Cosgrave rode him and and said that he'll win a maiden so we're going the right way and um hopefully we see him on the track pretty soon just as a final sort of point how much how much of a part does Sam Haggis play in your operation these days it's quite a big part I assume with the way that you know you both come together to buy the horses don't you and bring different things to the table yeah, absolutely. I it's it's very hard to to do everything in all aspects of life, let alone training horses and and spending hours and hours going through the catalogs for yearlings and then horse and training and everything it can become you know it's sort of too much. And and Sam does all the work on the the sales behind the scenes. And then we look around a lot of horses today, and um, it's been it's what I started my business doing, and you know I'll continue to do so. I think. You know that we've had two Royal Ascot winners, and they both bought at the horse and training sales. And for me, mm. that's what we want to be doing. And um, no, look, he's a he's a huge part of the team, and um, I hope we'll be so for a very long time. And finally, George, if you give us one from your team that you expect to run really well in the in the coming days, one horse that you're really looking forward to for Flat Out and Opulence members. As a horse like sport by Sam called Conquistador, who's third at Royal Ascot. Um, not entirely sure where he goes yet. He may well go to Newmarket this week on Friday. Um, if we miss the rain, he'll be very hard to beat, I think. he's The stiff track here should suit him. And um, he just was slightly caught flat-footed at Ascot. And he's a bit of a work in progress. I thought that I think he went off favourite on the day. And, and we did hope he'd go pretty close. But um, he's progressing nicely and, you know, pretty fast on the US Navy flag. And... Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a little bit left in the tank there. Jack will be hit. very, very glad to hear that as he was his best bet of Royal Ascot, actually, anti-post. So, yeah, I'm sure we'll be looking forward to seeing him run again. Thank you very much for joining us today, George. That was really insightful and really helpful. Top man, no worries. Oh, just brilliant to hear from George Bowie. So thanks very much to his time and thanks very much indeed to Joey Labour as well for... Uh, asking some very pertinent and accurate and intelligent questions as well. So really good to hear from George there. Kind of <laughs> About uh, all the options for red horses and, of course, his Group 1 and his Group Stars as well for this season, of which he's got plenty. Uh, let's move on then. I'm going to do the first of my curious cases uh, this week, which actually focuses on the thoroughbred 
ratings for world racehorses and the Longines updated list is due out in a couple of days time at time of recording um but we do have the trt horse rankings that have come in i expect them to be reflected in the Longines ranking as well and before this week we'd had a very globe trotting world global look to the rankings in, in the fact that equinox who is still number one obviously from Japan, then Hong Kong Golden 60, Cody's Wish in America, Anna Moe and Giga Kick from Australia, Lucky Swainess from Hong Kong and Romantic Warrior from Hong Kong, and then Elite Power as well from America. So very much a, a dominated global ranking system that is, of course, open to British and Irish horses, but not necessarily one in which we're, we're currently taking part. Now, it's good to see that in the, in the updated TRC rankings that, Paddington has made it into fourth spot, according to them, after that Eclipse victory. And after winning at Royal Ascot, Mostadaf has made his way into eighth place. But I did just want to draw attention to the fact that even as soon or near as 10 years ago, this would have been a rankings list that was full and chocker of British and Irish racehorses. And now it's very much the reverse of that. We've seen it as a growing trend in horses being bought by other countries and going down under or going to America or going to Japan to try and ply their trade over there because the prize money is greater. And unfortunately, I think that is being shown in the rankings for these world race horses as well. And it's coming to the stage where horses like Paddington and Mostadaf we're having to rely on to get into these top rungs. And unfortunately, I just don't think it's really good enough for a, for a country like ours, which is, I would say, at the forefront. It always has been a flat thoroughbred racing to be only represented by two horses amongst the 10. And um, we're a way off the likes of Cody's Wish Golden 60, and particularly Equinox, I would say. I think the Australian element to it is always a bit up for debate. You know, Anna Moe really did that good, considering some of his form behind Dubai Honor doesn't look very strong now. But um, Dubai Honor probably ran better in Australia than he did at Sandown. Um, Joey, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've got any views on, on, the, on the world rankings at the moment and the, and the lack of power from, from Britain and Ireland and, and whether you think it's a bit of a shame. or I don't know if you've got any views on that. I, I mean, I, I think it's always exceptionally hard to come up with the way of doing these rankings to make it um, accurate. Um, it, in, ten, in terms of that, I, I don't dispute, you know, that there's some really clever compute. I kind of basically... I, when I've heard it kind of um, described to me, you have essentially a computer algorithm talking you through these sorts of things. It seems to me that it's, it's very tricky to do that properly, especially when you've got completely different styles of racing. You know, like you've got forerunner eclipse over here where you'd never see Golden 60 running in a forerunner race over in Hong Kong. And you, you tend to get a huge number. You get a nice big field with a load of horses that it's easier to rate really highly. I'm not sure if that makes a huge... I mean, it seems to make a huge difference in the way that the races are run. Um, there are certain advantages to being in certain parts of the world where you can prove how good you are. I think, I'm think i not sure that this list shows that we have a weakness in terms of our thoroughbreds over here. It's just I think it's more reflective probably of the quality of our top level fields and our racing and its ability to prove how good our horses are that would be my first thought really i mean if you go to japan for example you're just looking at an incredibly competitive scenario where the best horse will be able if it is able to prove it's the best horse will show by a mile that it's the best horse so i don't i don't know i think european racing that the, the difference between the two it's very hard to come up with a system what you want with the trc is you really want more horses traveling around the world and competing against each other and with ideas like the breeders cup essentially you've got that opportunity and you really want to see more horses traveling around the world so we can test it out and probably get a more accurate system i think our biggest problem is the horses below the top rung leaving these shores just below a shade below which probably doesn't help us justify how, how high quality you, know, you had a load of runners in that eclipse that made an absolute fill tilt boogie uh gallop where they're all strung out like washing and you had like 110 rated horses being left behind by paddington then you'd probably be able to rate the race a bit more accurately whereas what you do have is tend to have these more tactical small field races so yeah that's just my thoughts what would you what would you think about that jack would you have you would you see anything in that or or tom in what i've just said there you think load of nonsense or no, I think that's a fair enough assessment. I'm I'm quite naive to all the ratings and stuff. It's for me, it's subjective and all that. And like, if you got Equinox coming to to the arc, he would drown in the Longchamp mud. But 
obviously we've seen Westover was put in his place at Maidan. It, it's different places, different conditions. And um, you, you, you see the likes of Dubai on who hasn't really raised the gallop in this country yet. He goes over to Australia and he looks a superstar. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just so hard to, to quantify these things, in my opinion. As I say, it's subjective. And um, Like, look at Flightline last year. Fair enough, he was streets above. But if you raced him on turf, it's, it's as I say, it's different... It's, it's different conditions entirely, isn't it? Different hemispheres, and yeah, um, I just find it hard to to really quantify, and I don't really pay much much notice to it, to be honest with you, lads. I don't. I think that's absolutely fair. I, I think what I would say is that I wouldn't say there's a huge amount of points to them. I think it's more mm. of a case of it's quite an enjoyable yeah that's fair. Uh, system to look at and to comment on, and it doesn't definitely raise debate as it has done here. Um, mm. I'll, I'll finish on this comment, on this topic, sorry, by commenting on one other thing about it uh, and the fact that uh, the uh, noticeable lack of French horses in the list has been evident for quite a long time now and certainly in the top 10 of the rankings. And I think this th there is a problem at the top level in terms of French racehorses coming through and, and the amount of really good Group 1 horses they have. It's been a, a problem for a couple of years now. Um, as evidenced really by Westover's win in, in the Grand Prix de saint on Sunday, uh, in which he didn't really have much to beat at all. A four on a race, I think, and he was sent off long odds on. He worked fairly hard for it, but he did it fairly easily. Um, and yeah, I think that's a bit of a shame, really, because along with our kind of falling, uh, dwindling numbers in that list, I think France are even worse and um, sort of suffered even worse than us. But um yeah, interesting, interesting thoughts on, on that. Uh, that's my curious case. It really was quite curious this week. And um, <laughs> Joey, I, I, Joey, I know you've got some, uh, well, your bloodstock bulletin, shall we call it, for, for, for this edition. Yes, I, I don't want to keep everyone too long on this one, but just I thought it was quite interesting as that Too Darn Hot was back quite, quite heavily um, at the start of the year to be first season champion, first season sire. We certainly haven't seen that materialise so far. I just thought it was worthy of bringing up that he's had basically about 13 runners and three winners. Um, not exactly what people were expecting. And it kind of brought up a point, I think me and you, know, you guys were discuss discussing at the start of the year, that maybe I think it's a good way to look at pedigrees is that you're looking for the norm in the pedigree. So we, we always discuss, me and Jack, because he's a massive fan of the Fugue, that you know the Fugue as a broodmare, she's been a bit disappointing. As a racehorse, she was fantastic. Well, the thing about her was that she was more of the outlier in her family. She was a bit of a, a fluke, essentially, of nature, that she came together to be a brilliant racehorse. We're too darn hot. The What is the norm in his family is a bit more towards the stamina side. And I know, obviously, coming out of, essentially, you know, he's where this horse I'm going to discuss was individualism that ran for Charlie Johnson in the week at air made his debut thought he was a very very promising debut too darn hot uh half basically half brother to the likes of subjectivist Sir Ron Priestley so really nice staying horses I don't debate that for a minute but you would have thought hey is this going to put a little bit of a little bit of speed into these horses no it's putting a bit more stamina in he looked just like his brothers to me he's going to be all about staying this horse and it wouldn't surprise me you're seeing two darn hots make their debuts over seven furlongs i think we'll be seeing the battle of best of them best of them up to middle distances i think that's probably clear his family generally is about staying you go see the somi dars the lati dars that's more what it is he was the fluke in his family so i wouldn't be looking really for speed coming from his from his offspring essentially i think middle distance is going to be what he's about just my my thought for the week oh that's i have to say i think it's absolutely fascinating because if you if you looked at two darn hot as a as a horse himself he was much more about the kind of precocious speed, wasn't he? And even the mile yeah. group one that he did win was the Sussex Stakes, which is one of the fastest group one mm -hmm. over a mile there is. Um, so the fact that his offspring are slightly more stamina laden is, I think, really interesting. And they may be, they may be. Obviously, I'm not saying 100%. Obviously, we may see about, you know, we may see about three or four come out in the next week that all look speedy as hell. But all, if you look at his kind of DNA imprint coming from his family, he's going to be more about kind of a mile plus. A mile around, around a mile, a mile plus will be his sort of thing. I think that'll be what what he's about as a as a stallion. Rather than he was a bit of a surprise. He was a surprise in every way to everyone at Watership Down. But uh, yeah, so I just think it's something worth keeping an eye on as we go. And we've got a little, we've got a few runners to make that judgment on now. 
Yeah, lovely stuff. Bit of an anomaly, wasn't he? Yeah, too darn hot. Um, chaps, I think that uh, wraps us up nicely uh, for this week and for this edition as well. Um, so good stuff, and hopefully with some some winners in there as well. And um, just to, to finish off with, please do remember to gamble responsibly. Uh, gambling should be fun at the end of the day, and when the fun stops, please do stop. Uh, thank you very much indeed to Opulence for their continued sponsorship of the podcast. Don't forget to visit their website as well and look at opportunities to get involved in racehorse ownership because it is very accessible in Opulence Thoroughbreds' uh, kind of manifesto of, of doing things. Yeah, hopefully you enjoy the fantastic week's racing and uh, the weekend's fair. And please don't forget to like and subscribe and indeed comment on maybe your, your best bet of the weekend or anything you've enjoyed particularly about this podcast because we'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you. But until next time, that's it from myself, Jack and Joey. Mm-hmm.